Good evening. Grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. As you can see, we're in very different surroundings tonight for our Good Friday service. We aren't in Casa Caulfield Church and we aren't in Eglis Church either, but we're actually here in the Mass. So it's, it's good, to be able to, good to be able to welcome you, whether you're a member of either congregation or a visitor from elsewhere, here to our home. Just to fill you in a wee bit on our situation, you may have heard that Claire had taken on well and we were in quarantine. Well, Claire had developed uh, a mild cough during the week and a high temperature, so had returned home from work. And at that point, we went into quarantine as a family here. Now, health workers are being tested for coronavirus. The reason for that is if the test com comes back as negative, they're then able to return to their work instead of remaining in quarantine for longer than is necessary. So Claire was tested and the result came back yesterday evening to tell us that the result was negative. And so we're thankful for that. We're very thankful that we're all okay. And thankful, thankful for your prayers as well and good wishes. So um, as I say, we're thankful and it's good to be able to welcome you here this evening. Somebody else I'm delighted to be able to welcome is Brian Clenahan. <clears throat> Brian has been with us a number of times over recent summers um, and it's great that he's able to join us from Larne for, uh, to bring us our Good Friday sermon this evening. Now two words that I've heard a lot in recent days to describe the situation we find ourselves in are strange and, and different. And today has very much been a strange and a different Good Friday. Normally we would have enjoyed a, a great breakfast in the Asselson Hall at a Good Friday breakfast and then we would have been starting our Good Friday communion service in Eglish around this time. But instead we can't do those things and we're separated physically. But we're thankful that we're still joined in the spirit, thankful that we're still able to join and worship God together. And I pray that as we worship him now you would know his blessing, that you would have a sense of him renewing you refreshing you um, emotionally, spiritually, that you would have that sense of him strengthening you for the days ahead and that sense of his loving presence around you. As we begin our worship, I want to read some verses from Isaiah 53, words we often turn to at this time of year. And they begin with a question. It asks us, who has believed what we have heard and to whom as the arm of the Lord been revealed. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we account him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. And by his bruises we are healed. Let's turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we turn to you now in worship and in praise. We thank you that we can come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. The one who, who gave himself on the cross. The one who gave his life that we might live. Jesus forsook no one, yet was forsaken by the closest of his friends. Lord, you committed no crime and yet you uh, were sentenced to a criminal's death. We approach you in awe and in adoration. And Lord Jesus, we think about how all those centuries ago you could have saved your life, but you refused to betray the purpose for which you came to this, to this world, the purpose for which you were born. You'd come to this earth in love. You had come to seek and to save the lost. And when that loving work required you to shoulder a cross, you summoned the strength to bear it. Today, dear Lord, as we sing and pray and read about the cross, we ask that you would teach us once again. You know where each of us is tonight, spiritually, physically, Emotionally. Some of us come uh, feeling lonely. Many of us may be fearful or afraid 
or angry or confused. Some of us are overwhelmed in trying to protect life and save life. Exhausted but unable to sleep. Dear Lord, we thank you that Good Friday, maybe more than any day, tells us that you know what it is to suffer. To feel intense loneliness, intense pain. Meet us this evening, we pray. Draw alongside us to bless us and restore us. To strengthen our hearts by your grace. That we would go from this service built up and reminded of your grace and love for us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn now invites us to, to look to the cross. Come and see, come and see, come and see the King of love. And I, as always, I invite you to, to sing along or, or if not sing along, at least to focus on the words uh, and listen to them as we, as we worship together. So come and see. Come and see, come and see, come and see the King of love. See the purple robe and crown of thorns he wears Soldiers mock, rulers sneer As he lifts the cruel cross Lone and friendless now he climbs towards the hill We worship at your feet Where wrath and mercy meet And the guilty world is washed By love's pure stream For as he was made sin Oh, help me take it Father, forgive I worship I worship The Lamb Who was slain Come and weep Come and mourn deeper than the wounds of fall and nail. All our pride, all our greed, all our fallenness and shame, and the Lord has laid the punishment on Him. We worship To restore us to your hell 
Here we bow in all beneath your searching eyes. From your tears comes our joy. From your death our life shall spring. By your resurrection power we shall rise. We worship at your feet where wrath and mercy meet. And the guilty world is washed by love's pure stream. turn now to our first reading and this evening we have two readings and the first one is from Matthew uh, chapter 27 we'll turn to Matthew again on Sunday morning all being well just as we read from Matthew Sunday past so we're going to read from Matthew verses 45 through to 56 and let us hear the word of God if you have a Bible there I invite you to read along with me <clears throat> uh, and to follow along as we read together so let's read from Matthew 27 from verse 45, let us hear the word of God. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the whole land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and gave it and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those standing there, uh, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely this was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They'd followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were, were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. And we thank the Lord for this reading of his word. We turn again to prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we look to you again in prayer. And we look to Christ, the, the King of love. We think of our sin that pierced him at Calvary. And we confess how we have betrayed you and denied you, just as uh, your people did in his day. We have betrayed you. At those times when we've been selfish or unkind. We've denied you perhaps when we've kept quiet when we should have spoken up. We've denied you in those times when we've trusted in ourselves rather than looking to you as our God. Lord we confess that all too often we settle for a dim and a distant knowledge of you. And a dim and a distance, distant awareness of of you and your presence. Forgive us, we pray, Lord. Remind us this night of the forgiveness that Jesus won for us 
at the cross. And as we turn again to your word, now we ask that you would teach us and guide us and challenge us by your Holy Spirit. Bless Brian as he opens your word to us. We thank you for him. And we ask that you would work in our hearts tonight, that we would respond this evening, that we would be doers and not just hearers. So bless your word to us again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we turn again to God's word and we read now from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 7 to 13. And again I would invite you to read there with me. So Hebrews 8 from verse 7 to 13. <clears throat> Let us hear the word of God. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no uh, place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them declares the Lord this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time declares the Lord I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts I will be their God and they will be my people no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying know the Lord because they will all know me from the greatest of them to the least. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he's made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete in ageing will soon disappear. Amen. We thank the Lord for this reading of his word. As I've said, it's great to have Brian Clenhan with us and a hand over to Brian now as he brings us our Good Friday sermon. Brian. Good evening, folks. It's a privilege to be with you on this Good Friday evening. Even though it is in unusual circumstances, many today are faced with isolation, some unable to meet their friends and family because of the situation we find ourselves in. We are indeed living in difficult times, in abnormal times, and in many cases, distressing times. Of course, the Lord Jesus was no stranger to isolation. At this time of the year, we remember his time in the Garden of Gethsemane. And those who were with him on that occasion fell asleep. And we remember especially on the cross, those words that he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it is to the cross that I want to turn our attention this evening. I want to do that with the prayer that what is told to us in Hebrews 12 to will be our desire, looking to Jesus. We live in days of uncertainty and fear, days when people are looking for security, looking for someone that gives them hope. Hebrews chapter 8 read to us earlier speaks to us about the certainties that we as Christians have. Certainties based on God's propositional truth. His word. God is a God of covenant. One who deals with humanity through covenants. And we of course as Presbyterians are no strangers to the idea of covenants. Our forefathers 
were known as covenanters. The word covenant means to bind. And those involved in a covenant are bound together in that covenant agreement. And the whole idea of a covenant runs throughout the scriptures. We can think of the covenant of redemption between the three persons of the Trinity. We can think of God's covenant of works made with Adam, with the covenant made with Abraham, which we term the covenant of grace. And it's to that covenant tonight that I want us to think. I want us to focus our attention there and to think within that covenant of God binding himself to save sinners. This covenant of grace, of course, is only one covenant. It's been administered in two different ways. In the Old Covenant or Old Testament, it was typified in all the ceremonial laws that Moses gave. In the New Covenant or New Testament, it is brought together and culminated in the Lord Jesus Christ, and particularly in his dying on the cross. Now, to these Hebrew Christians who were getting this letter, they were sorely pressed and tempted to go back on their profession. They were tempted to live by sight and not by faith. And the writer of the Hebrews shows them that the new covenant under which they are brings to them certainties. It brings assurance. Certainties and assurance based on God's word and particularly given in Jeremiah 31, which is quoted in fair detail in Hebrews 8. So let's think together on those certainties and on those encouragements that we find in this passage tonight. And let's do that with our Bibles open so that we can share together and go through together from God's word. In verses 7 to 9 of Hebrews 8, we find certainty because of the promise of God's grace. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the old covenant that I made with their fathers. God was good to Israel. He had led them out of Egypt as a father would take a child by the hand. He gave them his law for their good and to protect them. He wanted to protect them from the sins of other nations. And so his law was given for their good, for their protection. But as they stood on Mount Sinai, they promised God all the words the Lord has said we will do. But sadly they failed. They didn't do it. And Hebrews 8 verse 9 tells us, they continued not in my covenant. However, the new order spoken of in our passage, it isn't founded on our ability to obey or on our will but upon the grace of God. It is based upon the I will of God and not upon the we will of men and women. Remember what grace is. It is God giving us what we do not deserve. And, and in our natural condition, we don't deserve anything from the Lord. The one thing, the only thing that we really have and that which we can call our own is our sin. Yet God, full of grace and love, has given us his promises, which can never fail and will never be broken. This new order, this new covenant, is solely dependent upon the grace of God. God 
has taken the initiative. God has drawn up the covenant. God has provided the mediator of the covenant and God has provided the sacrifice in order to seal that covenant. All that is required of us is that we have faith, that we believe, faith and belief in what God has accomplished. And then in verse 10 of Hebrews 8, we, we find more certain day because the promise of eternal change is given. We find more certain day in the promise of eternal change. I would put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. Under the old order, the law of Moses could deliver God's standards. It could tell the people what God required, but it couldn't provide the power that they needed to obey and to fulfill God's commandments. You see, sinful people needed something inside them, a new heart, a new disposition towards righteousness. And that is exactly what the new order, the new covenant provides. You see, the law was external. It was written on tablets of stone. The covenant of grace is in internal. It's written on the minds and on the hearts of people. And all this, of course, is based on the Old Testament scriptures. Passages like Ezekiel 11 and verse 10. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new heart within them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Or again, in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give them a new heart and put a new spirit within them. Those and other scriptures, along with Jeremiah 31, where the new covenant is specifically referred to, the promise given by God is one of an internal change. And the New Testament in Hebrews 8 shows us their fulfillment. We read in Titus 3 where Paul says, He saved us by the washing of a new birth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul says that these Corinthians who he was writing to, they're the result of his ministry. And he says that it was written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. You see, this change could only come through the new order, for it was not based upon external obedience. Doesn't Paul say in another place, not the righteousness that we have done, but the work of God, the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Do you remember Lydia? It tells us about Lydia that she was a lady whose heart the Lord opened. John Calvin, when he was telling of how he was brought to faith in the Lord Jesus, put it simply by saying as God subdued my heart. You see, all the outward obedience to the law and all the outward religious duty can never change you. Only as you are changed inside, only as a hardened heart is replaced by a heart of flesh, can you know peace with God. And Christ, in fulfilling the covenant requirements, he has secured that change. And what is required of us, what is required of you is faith in what he has accomplished. And then we read in verse 12 about another certainty. A certainty that comes because of the promise of complete forgiveness. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. There was no forgiveness, you see, under the old order. For the law was not given for that purpose. Romans 3 and 20 tells us 
no one will be declared righteous by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So under the old order, as the priest came with the sacrifice to the holy place, that there was just a continual remembrance of sin, but there was no remission. There was no forgiveness of sin. And Hebrews 10 reminds us of that when it says, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. However, the good news is that now because Jesus by the sacrifice of himself on the cross has paid the price of sin, has brought into being the new order. Therefore, God is able to keep his promise of forgiveness. And what a promise that is. If I, if you, place our faith and our trust in what Jesus has done, then the Father promises, I will remember their sin no more. Uh, that's a wonderful phrase. That phrase, remember no more, simply means hold against you no more. You see, God does recall what we have done, our sin, our transgression, but he does not hold it against us. Instead, he deals with us on the basis of grace and mercy. Once sin has been forgiven, it is never brought before us again. People may do that, but the Lord doesn't. And how can this be? Well, only because of Calvary. For there on the cross, the Lord Jesus in all his purity and in all his righteousness and in all his innocence is treated by the Father as though he has sinned. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He is treated as sin, as though we had sinned, so that we can be treated as though we had never sinned. What a great gospel. What a, a blessed covenant. Are you troubled by sin tonight? Does your conscience condemn you? Christian friend, do you get fearful sometimes? Are you concerned sometimes about your position before God? Are you anxious? Oh, surely these promises, these certainties should cause us to flee to Jesus, to trust him, to rest in his work, lean upon him as our substitute. Because God says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Friday the 10th of April 2020, in a troubled world, in an insecure world, among people stripped of all the things that they once thought vital, people insecure, uncertain, God presents us with certain assurances promises of his grace, promises of internal change and promises of complete forgiveness. Oh, tonight, may this great God and Saviour be ours. May we rest upon the promise of his word. May we know the hope and the comfort, the assurance and the certainty. As Augustus Top Lady, the great hymn writer says, a sovereign protector I have. Unseen yet forever at hand, unchangeably faithful to save, almighty to rule and command. He smiles, and my comforts abound. His grace is the dew shall descend, and walls of salvation surround the soul he delights to defend. Oh, what a saviour, at this Easter time again. As our minds focus particularly and probably more especially than at other times on the dying of the Lord Jesus. What a great victory over sin and over death 
and over hell, a victory that is ours through faith alone in the Lord Jesus alone. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks that in your word we find strength and assurance. We thank you this evening that he who knew no sin was made sin for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Father, with David we cry, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Grant unto us, O Father, that we may know with the prophet of old, and be able to say, even in the wormwood and in the gall, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Give us, Lord, the faith to rest and trust in our Lord Jesus and to know him in all his greatness. Amen. Thank you, Brian. We now come to our closing hymn. And uh, it's a hymn that we're, that we're going to sing that we can, that we sing all year round. Yet seems especially appropriate at this Good Friday. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, and a hymn that brings us a real challenge at the end of it. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's join and praise God together. A reminder at this point of our Sunday morning service we, we meet at 10.30 uh, as normal and uh, uh, we look forward to that our Easter, mon Easter morning service and as you go may you know the blessing of God so uh, may you find in the cross a sure ground for faith a firm support for hope and the assurance of sins forgiven and may the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit go with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>